Thanks for pressing play. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real conversations that celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. We're sponsored by the good folks at Oracle NetSuite. Learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business at netsuite.com slash different today. NetSuite is the category king in cloud ERP, so they are the platform for growth for small e entrepreneurs. And as a listener to this podcast, they are offering you an opportunity to have a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry. So check out netsuite.com slash different. All right, on this episode, we have Silicon Valley entrepreneur, CEO, and category designer, my buddy, Vanit Jain. Vanit and I have known each other for the better part of a decade, and he's the founder of a very successful, uh, fast-growing company called Ignite. And uh, we did some work together when he first founded the company, and we've been in touch off and on over the years, and I've admired uh, what he's done tremendously. Ignite has become the category king in what today you could think of as content collaboration, protection, and storage, with a particular focus on mid-sized growing companies. They're about 600 people, and most recently they just raised a $75 million funding round led by none other than Goldman Sachs. Uh, Vanit and I have a riveting conversation about how he charted a very different path. When he started Ignite, he pretty much did the opposite of what almost everybody in tech was uh, doing and saying you should do, and it significantly has paid off. He's also taken a um, tortoise versus hare kind of approach, uh, which is also very unique. He's not one of these get, get, um, get big fast type guys. He's one of these slow and steady wins the race kind of folks. And he's also managed to um, be very counterintuitive and design a category position for himself and uh, uh, Ignite as a company that stays out of the crosshairs of his much larger competitors. Even if you're not in the technology industry, you're going to gain some real insights in how to muster the courage to play the long game, stick to your convictions, niche down, and win. For more on this episode, go to Lockhead.com and you can check out the show notes, key takeaways, and more on Vanit's amazing background. Now... Hey ho, let's go. The last few months have been very interesting. We raced around after five years. Uh, this came in late November. And then we had a fiscal year end, December. So you can imagine uh, the amount of pressure, new investor in. Q4 always has to be the biggest quarter, so made that happen. And then I was mentioning earlier, we had our sales kickoff just last week. So it's been quite an event for the last 30, 45 days. It is in the, incredible in the, in the enterprise space, right? Because... We always, most of us are on Q4s, calendar Q4s, so there's this huge push. And then, uh, you know, my old buddy Jay Larson used to feel this way about sales kickoff. He wanted, if he could have had it his way, he would have done sales kickoff on January 1st, maybe January 2nd, because he felt like the sooner you did sales kickoff, the better. And so, yeah, the net of it is there's sort of a three-month period from sort of after Thanksgiving to you know, I don't know, mid, mid February where you're just running really hard. Yeah. You know, it, I'm sure you've dealt with it hundreds of times before. So you finished Q4 and December 29th, we knew that the quarter was coming in. We're going to exceed that. It was a record quarter. So there's some level of exultation and excitement, but honestly, dude, this lasted only till 31st night. First morning <laughs> I woke up, I'm like, Oh, here we go again. <laughs> So, you know, there's no, there's no time to sort of salivate and enjoy what you've done. It's always like you're constantly onto something, but at the same time, that's what makes it exciting. Yeah. There's that Jay-Z song where he sings on to the next one, on to the next one. And it's just, that's what it feels like. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. And it's, it's also like, Hey, congratulations on the quarter. Now, uh, what are you going to do next quarter? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know about how you feel, but you know, I have had a lot of New Year's Eves ruined by trying to get the quarter done, you know? <laughs> you know, uh, December, of course, is an interesting month because you have the Christmas and Christmas Eve. And I, interestingly, on 23rd, I took my little boy to San Diego. I'd never done that. So I had to do the obligatory Legoland and SeaWorld and what's the other one? The zoo. The zoo. We did that, came back on 26th. And 27, 28, 29th, you know, you are trying to make everything and 
uh, anything happen in order to make sure you hit the numbers. And despite this uh, high velocity, relatively low ARPA model that we believe we had perfected, there's now a pronounced hockey stick effect because as the numbers are getting bigger, the deals are getting bigger. It almost seems to like come together in the last, not just the week, the last three or four days, and they can be nail biting. And I hate that, but that's the nature of the beast. That's how it seems to be. And I'm not able to escape that. Well, and it's funny, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can make a fake close uh, 15 days ahead of time. You can provide incentives for the sales force to close early, all this sort of stuff. And, you know, maybe some of that stuff can help on the margin. But in my experience, when whatever the quarter end is, that's what it's going to come down to in the enterprise space. Yeah, exactly. In fact, you know, we had contemplated a couple of years back that we should offset just like a lot of companies fiscal year end not to be January end, sorry, December end, but January end, basically plus one month. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there was going to be this overhead of we had to get the audits redone for the last four years. So that's a painful process, but let's aside, put that aside, the effort and expense. Fundamentally, the mind shift change needs to happen that if you're giving them an extra month, my suspicion was exactly what you said. They would make the last four days of January to be as nail biting as the last four days of December and there would not be any additional benefits. So I didn't really see the need for doing that. Yeah. The only benefit to that that I'm aware of is, uh, you know, you don't ruin New Year's Eve, you ruin the last day of January instead. (laughs) That's true. But you know, man, you get to a point in age where it doesn't really matter. The New Year's Eve, yeah, okay, we have to go to some party, we'll show up. But the mind is constantly churning about business. It's like you're looking at what the impending Q1 is calling for, the seasonality factor. Have we drained the swamp in Q4? The softness that January is going to start with all the usual crap that anyone has to deal with these days. Uh, And I can remember being at New Year's Eve parties, being on my mobile phone, hiding in a closet or a bathroom somewhere, you know, talking to the handful of deals that I was the executive sponsor on and checking in with our CFO and our head of sales and you know, all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, there's just no way around it. The end of the quarter is the end of the quarter, wherever you put it. <laughs> Absolutely. No <laughs> and, uh, about it. But with, and without sort of, you kick me if I ask you anything you don't want to get into, but um, uh, hoping you had a good uh, Q4 year end. It was a record Q4. Um, I, on one hand, it's so exciting. So at the end of the quarter, uh, before, the books truly close. Once we've done the soft close, I generally send a quarterly um, report to the board. It's almost like a very short two or three paragraphs and then the details follow later. And it's so nice to be able to have the same subject line, record quarter in the history of the company. And just to rub it in, (laughs) I take the previous quarter's email and I will resend it. And of course the content is different. So I was able to do this for the last nine quarters. Uh, but now the laws of big numbers are catching up, man. And uh, this in, this quarter is going to be an interesting one. It's going to be a dogfight. Yeah, well, st- sooner or later, uh, even redwoods don't grow to infinity, right? Exactly. Especially yeah. now with the drought and everything else happening. <laughs> yeah, well, there ain't, the there's drought. not a drought outside my window today, I'll tell you. We've been getting pounded here lately. You're in Santa Cruz or where are yeah. you down? Yeah, Santa Cruz. Yeah, I think the entire Bay Area, it's, it's been a lot of rain, but that's all good, man. I won't complain. Yeah, no. Although the only bummer around here, we have a lot of eucalyptus trees and they fall on people's houses and shit. But other than that, it's, uh, it's great and obviously we need it. Yeah, yeah. Eucalyptus because shallow roots or why is that? Yeah, apparently, look, I'm no arborist, but what I'm to understand is, yeah, they have a shallow root system. They're obviously not a native plant to, uh, to Northern California. That's and true. so um, the the wind the rain makes the soil really uh, mushy, and uh, and then you know around here you know like last night we had thirty forty mile winds coming off the ocean so yeah we've had in the past we've had them fall and smash through people's houses and shit and yeah. you know they take out power lines and all of that stuff but they sure are beautiful and they smell nice and they're the um, They've become the, I don't know if this is the, how it is in Australia, but here anyway, they are, the, they are the breeding ground, the nesting ground for the monarch butterfly. The eucalyptus? Yeah. I don't know if they're the only one, but they're certainly one of them. And so a healthy eucalyptus grove equals uh, healthy uh, monarch butterflies. And over the last couple of years, the monarch butterfly, uh, 80% of them in Northern California have died. And the, I've read a bunch about it. It doesn't 
is unclear. Um, so scientists are unclear what the real cause of it is, but they're dying at scary, scary numbers. Yeah, I read about this in the Chronicle a couple of weeks back. And in fact, within a week of that, they talked about overall worldwide insect population has been tumbling. Yeah. And of course, they talk about the, the, the pollution and all kinds of other impacts, including global warming being a contributor. But the monarch thing has been a big news lately. I, I, I also read the same thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed. I know there's a bunch of really smart uh, scientists working on it here. Um, so f- fingers crossed we're going to figure it out because they sure are beautiful. No question. Indeed. And uh, they draw a lot of tourists to Santa Cruz, too, to see all of the uh, to see all the monarch butterflies. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's the place uh, near Montre, that town, Pacific Grove, right? Yeah. I mean, that's known for the, the cluster of uh, these butterflies, uh, specifically in a season. I think a lot of people go there as well. Yeah, and we have a place called Natural Bridges on the west side. Uh, and there's, mm. a, there's a, I believe it's a state park, if I'm not mistaken. And there's a, there's a eucalyptus grove there that has a huge, huge number of them. And if you go at the right time, there are just thousands of them, and it's quite spectacular. So... You know, what I'm really, one of the things I'm really curious to talk to you about is um, you have built a very successful business, as you said, nine quarters in a row of records, against a landscape of massive competitors, and, and at the risk of you kicking me, um, competitors who at one time looked like they might really threaten the success, if not the actual viability of Ignite, and yet you have been able to uh, niche down and find a, a uh, I'd say not find, but uh, make a place in the market where you can really win. And so I, I'm curious if you could unpack some of that for me, Vineet. You know, if you recall, uh, this is almost nine years back when Mike Maples introduced us. I don't know if you remember that. Has it been that long? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. And uh, just a couple of scotches had- ago. Uh, you may, I don't remember what we were imbibing, but yeah, whatever. Um, but I remember we, you had mentioned things like the art of war, or, you know, the Sun Tzu book and all that. And, uh, I, the, the reason I refer to that is indeed this company of ours has grown in the big shadow being cast by some of the players who had a lot more funding, in fact, in terms of billions of dollars and our company. Uh, kind of swam upstream as it appeared to an outsider in two, two terms. I reason, the reason I use that is for two reasons. One is uh, we had only raised $62.5 million until November of 2018. Uh, so this was the last round of funding came in November 13. The total corpus of money raised was 62.5. And since then, the company was growing, building organically, uh, I would say slow and steady. The compounded growth rate wasn't spectacular. It was 30 to 35% year over year. But it came along with the company turning cash flow positive in Q4 of 16. And after that, we started spitting out cash practically every quarter. And we would plow it back into the business. And unlike companies in the Valley or in enterprise SaaS generally, where the zeitgeist is you raise around every 18 months, we kind of bucked that trend. And then when we raised financing last year, uh, after I pitched to my board in August, they were a little aghast to say, why do you want to raise financing? And I said, I can get you guys liquidity faster and I can bend the growth curve from 30 to 35% to 47 to 50%. And I had my whole thesis presented to them. And sure enough, we went and raised... uh, we got seven term sheets, uh, two were debt. I don't like debt being Indian at heart. And out of the five equity ones, I went in with the one least amount of structure, a clean and simple term sheet, and Goldman came in. They took $75 million in the company. And the reason as I go back into thinking why we have been able Can to- Can I just interrupt you there, Vineet? You yeah, say it so nonchalantly, like on my way to work this morning, I stopped at Verve and picked up a coffee. Uh, <laughs> no, <man. laughs> you, you raised 75 million bucks. Was it 75 million from Goldman? Am I remembering this? Is that what you said? That's correct. Yes. So, so hold on here, handsome. 
you just raised 75 million real Benjamins from Goldman fucking Sachs. Indeed, yes. That's a non-trivial accomplishment, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Although, you know, uh, Chris, as you've seen with mega funds, raising 50 to $100 million rounds, even in series B or C in the Valley or outside has become pretty uh, commonplace. And for us, it still is a huge amount of money. When you see it in uh, reference to the company had totally raised over four rounds, 62.5. So indeed, it's a huge amount. But uh, going back to your original question, um, I think over time and having made a lot of mistakes, we got more and more focused on, we will always, even with this money raised, we still have a size disadvantage. When I say size disadvantage, we are 600 plus employees, but resource-wise, people-wise, uh, they're bigger players. And hence, the reason I was referring to our conversation was, you cannot pick a fight with an enemy who has to pick your weapon of choice, an AK-47 or AR-15, whatever you like. And I have a wooden knife and it's a level playing field. You know what's going to happen. And how do you negate the size disadvantage by going for asymmetric warfare? And that asymmetry, and I'll give you credit for this, we had talked about nine years back was, okay, focus on the areas where A, your product resonates, the TAM is large enough, and the economics of the customer acquisition, you know, the standard CAC to LTV and all those ratios make a lot of sense. And I think that's where we progressively got better. And that was the underpinning of, I still believe, A, not just raising financing quite quickly, but also where this company is today and hopefully is accelerating beyond this point. Sorry, I had myself on mute. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Yeah. And so let's maybe if we could unpack that. So you as the category for uh, and you'll tell me, but uh, if we think of it broadly, could we call it cloud storage? Is that fair? Um, I actually avoid using the term. Because okay, great. Storage is just an enabler. And that is such a low margin business. It's a race to the bottom that we completely eschew that word on our website. So what do you call it these days? That's very interesting because when we built this product, uh, when you and I were uh, you know, uh, doing some work together, honestly, very simply in our mind, we were taking this construct of a file server that a business had, whether it's a small business with a server in a closet or big company with servers in data farms with all kinds of attached storage, direct or network attached, or even SANS in some cases. We were trying to take this architecture and have this multi-tenanted hosted, which initially, if you go back into Time Machine and look at our first website, when Mike Naples gave us the first initial round, we were calling it an on-demand file server. And of course, six months after we went out to the market, we realized that, holy shit, this is what people are calling the cloud. So we took on-demand out, put cloud in. But fundamentally, that's what the underpinning of what this company started with and has expanded beyond and this category itself was early at that time being called Enterprise File Sync and Share by the likes of Gartner's and yep, IDC. I remember that. And even though we were very differentiated from just uh, enabling uh, file sharing, we could do a lot more. We got clubbed in with, I would say, 100 plus vendors uh, by the likes of these guys. And we could stand up from the rafters with a big megaphone and say, we are different. It didn't matter. That's what you were tagged in as. We kept selling, we kept growing, but truly speaking, our fortunes changed in the last, I would say three and a half to four years when two things happened. The category itself expanded. So IT got comfortable by not just having their files or unstructured data, as we like to call, being moved to the cloud for file sharing purposes, both inter and intra enterprise. But IT started looking to say, why can't I map more and more business use cases, essentially retire all my data center infrastructure, all the hardware, the file servers, the storage, the MPLS networks, the van accelerators, FTP, whatever. Can I move that to the cloud? That was one. And the second was the adoption curve went mainstream beyond the SMB into the mid-market and enterprise. It's the confluence of these two factors suddenly acted as a huge demand for a company like Ignite. And we 
started having a little bit more preeminence in our technology, our capability. We've always been a very strong product centric company. Uh, goes back to my background and the three others. And we had this, I would say, honestly, uh, divine luck that our product and market fit happened at such an interesting time at such a rapid pace, which is what drove the demand curve uh, resulting in these nine quarters and stuff like that. So this category now has evolved into content collaboration. And just to add to that, sorry, it's a very long winded answer. That's okay. What we're seeing is that while IT is getting comfortable with this rapid acceleration of data to the cloud, the concerns around data security are exponentially multiplying. They're still afraid of the cloud. And there's a huge focus on not just basics like is my data encrypted at storage, but compliance, data retention, uh, data classification resulting in DLP-like capabilities. So this amalgamation of content collaboration and content governance is basically what this category seems to be becoming. And in Gartner speak, again, it's a content services platform. So if you were to ask me, Vineet, what is Ignite providing? I would simply say we provide enterprise class content services platform, which enables IT to retire all their hardware and yet have all of the security constructs that they could not do themselves from a governance compliance point of view, where you need one substrate, one platform to do it all, which is yes. what Ignite has become. Now, the thing I love about this is in the beginning, when it was cloud file server, there was a point in time where you also, uh, the word that Mike is sick, sick of hearing, right? I, I, I think he hates the day of ever saying it, but pivot. You also took a position early on that the hybrid cloud was the way to go. In other words, some of the early competitors were cloud, 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 cloud. And you took this position that said, hey, listen, don't be ridiculous. There's going to be some uh, storage, some files, some shit that you have that's, um, uh, that's going to be on-premise. And then there's going to be stuff that's on cloud. And there's going to be a mix of both. And you want to be able to synchronize across. And you're going to have shit on various devices. And sometimes that'll sync and sometimes it won't. And sometimes it'll sync to on-prem and sometimes it'll sync to the cloud. And sometimes it'll do both. And, and that you took this position that while there were these sort of, if you will, cloud religious zealots now, amongst your competitors, you said, hey, let's take a more thoughtful, practical approach as to how it's going to be. And, and you became really the champion or certainly one of the champions of quote unquote hybrid cloud. And now with that said, Vineet, in my mind, but obviously, you know better, you know this story better than I do. It was that move, that category position that you carved out years ago now that sets you up to be able to take advantage of what you've really been taking advantage of over the last couple of years. That's how I saw it as somebody who was kind of more or less, you know, watching with a, uh, a caring eye, if I could put it that way. But how, how, if you could explain that to me from hybrid cloud, taking that position to differentiate to where you are today, I'd be very curious as to your assessment. You know, I couldn't have said it better. So, uh, just as a reminder, my Twitter handle is cloud not enough. And I've I, always remembered that. And I remember <laughs> when you did it, I thought, you know, if this category positioning doesn't work for you, you may regret that Twitter handle. But sure enough, you were fucking right and you stuck to your guns. And you know, man, I'll tell you, I can place a bet. It'll still remain relevant for the next 10 years as, much, as far as I can see. Uh, so going back to uh, when we were launching Ignite, uh, you know, you, you find a lot of people coming from the Valley or in the tech world with a lot of vision and being completely honest and not being facetious for the sake of it. I'm not a great visionary. I'm a very solid execution guy is how I perceive myself. But one area where I would take the credit for saying I had the vision was my belief was you're taking something which is typically run behind the firewall. My data is available in my local network. I get all the uh, LAN access speeds. Uh, saying that everything will be completely substituted by the cloud, I did not believe that for a moment. And the rationale was that even if you get into a super connected office, you'll have clusters of people possibly working on large files where they need fast local access. 
they need concurrency and locking and things like that, whether you're working on, you know, CAD CAM drawings or Adobe in design files or something. And then when you look at larger and larger companies where you have remote sites and job sites where connectivity is poor or sometimes very expensive, the users need unimpeded access to their data. So all the rationale to say you would need a solution that would give you data closest to the edge, fastest way possible with whatever device, without the user really caring or uh, thinking about where is my file coming from. They just go onto their Finder on Mac or Explorer or Windows and they click this network drive and they get their files. So that was the underpinning of hybrid. So storage for us was the the unifying entity where your storage could be completely cloud or your storage could be a combination of on-prem and cloud. But the set of file services, which is what the end user cared about, I can access my files, I can share, I can FTP, I can archive, I can do data discovery, all that stuff. Uh, that was being enabled through the cloud. And initially, as you pointed out, we leveraged that strength in industries where we knew it's going to resonate architecture, engineering, construction, or AEC is the acronym, where we focused on big time. Uh, and we started finding that this problem or this solution capability resonated so much so that this is our number one industry segment right now. Then we parlayed that into uh, financial services. And financial services, not big banks for us, but regional banks, like whether it's a First Republic Bank or Wintrust or a lot of PE firms, they still want. You know, you know what I love? I hate to interrupt you, but what I love about what you've done in terms of the um, uh, segments or sizes of companies you've approached is you had an aha early on that some entrepreneurs, particularly in Silicon Valley, uh, seem to miss, which is there's a strategic problem with the Fortune 500. And that is there's 500 of them. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Right. But how many regional banks are there? You know, there's, I don't know, you tell me, there's probably 20 mega banks. And how many regional banks are there? Hundreds, thousands? Yeah. Within North America, we're talking about in uh, a few thousand, uh, not tens of thousands, but a few thousand. Uh, construction companies are huge. Uh, the other day, I was uh, in uh, near the Transbay Terminal. And uh, it was on the weekend with my little boy and my wife, and we were driving back. And I saw a sign of, uh, there was cranes from a company called Biggie, B-I-G-G-E. I told my son, hey, that's my customer. Further up, there was a company called XL Construction. XL Construction, based in Milpitas, our customer. Defcon, our customer. Um, it was so heartening that I'm bragging to my little boy, he's nine and a half. And then we came across Webcore. He said, is that your customer? I said, Damn it, it's not my customer yet. <laughs> I sent a note to our SDR leader to say, why aren't we targeting those guys? But Hey, let's go get them. To, exactly. <laughs> but you know, this is where that asymmetric warfare play to your strength. So I'm so proud to say that finally, the way I envision this is, if you could visualize, if I was doing whiteboarding in front of you, imagine a big circle on the bottom left. Big circle is consumer prosumer. Um, that's a territory that Dropbox has done very well at. Great engineering. I admire the company. But their ARPA is $114. That's a class of customers that we do not chase. We do not do anything about. If you still want to come to my website, you can sign up for a $45 plan, put on your credit card, we'll gladly take it. But there's not a single marketing program focusing on this absolutely not even when we started the company. We never catered to this uh, market segment. And as you saw them grow and take off and become the massive public company they are now and all that, you just seeded the market to them. You just said, okay, great. You, you win. We're going over here. Exactly. I, I, am no, I have no embarrassment in saying that's not the market I wanted to go in, even though we were seeing the meteoric rise and, you know, they built a great brand. Because you have to go back to your core knitting to say, what am I good at? You might have envy, not jealousy, I hope. And then there was on the top right, a smaller circle called the large enterprise, the fortune, let's call it 2,500. These are the class of customers we like. We want to have them, but we will not chase them. We have not a single program defined to go after this market. 
And that's a territory companies like Box claim that, oh, we are in 92% of them. Go ahead. But in the middle of this, Chris, is I call them middle kingdom. And that middle kingdom is segmented into what we call as commercial and enterprise. Companies between 50 to 750 employees and 750 to 7,500 employees. Further striped by the verticals, the five verticals that we have currently focused on. And that basically has become our mantra. Play to your strength and build this high velocity, relatively low ARPA model and keep gunning the engine higher. Where the commercial business, the, the 50 to 750 is 100% inside sales based. And the enterprise business is an inside out combination. I will not hire expensive sales people and map them to 23, 24, whatever. Now we have NFL cities and add an SDR and SE and PAM and this and that too expensive. And the sales cycles are long, too lumpy. And you are dependent on one or two. Nobody, to make likes make your nobody likes lumpy sales cycles. Exactly. So <laughs> this, this approach to say, this is the sweet spot, the uh, commercial and enterprise, our definition for the stripe by the industry segment is the asymmetric warfare. Take your limited ammunition so, and cluster bomb this territory and be dominant. So I love it. And this is the thing that I, I really want to underscore here. So there was two big things that I saw you do. One of them is what you were just talking about, which is the customer segmentation you took. And for some reason, particularly in the technology industry, so many companies miss the opportunity here. I mean, look, my friends at NetSuite who sponsor the podcast, this is where they've built their business, you know, on, on the fortune 2 million, so to speak, right? Yep, exactly. Uh, they're not the teeny weeny little um, a Quicken user. Um, and they're not the giant mega enterprise, to your point, the top 2,500 or whatever. But there's this massive uh, group of companies in between. And so you decided to fo focus there. But the other thing, so which is smart, but for some reason in Silicon Valley, for the most part, it's often a forgotten segment when in point of fact, it's a very large, profitable segment if you get it right, as you've shown, as NetSuite shown, as many others have shown. But the other thing that you did at the same time you were doing that, Vineet, you were saying, you know, you had your middle finger up going, hey, kind of fuck you. It's not cloud, cloud, cloud. You religious zealots are wrong. It's hybrid cloud. Right. And so when you were doing those two things at the same time, that to many, particularly in, in enterprise technology, are counterintuitive, maybe something they would consider stupid or they would have some kind of a pejorative opinion about that is to say you were going against what was the zeitgeist the common thinking cloud cloud at the time you were saying hybrid and you were steering into a um a customer segment opportunity that is for the most part um not viewed as important or sexy and so everything about what you've done <laughs> pretty much is counter what your competitors and counter frankly some of the uh, the quote unquote wisdom that is so considered to be the truth that most people don't even question it. They say, if you're in the enterprise space, you go after the big companies. And at the time it was cloud or nothing else. And so with all that said, Vineet, A, how did you know to do that? And B, how did you stick to your guns around your position, your category, your product strategy to meet the needs of that market when many, many other people could be telling you you were doing exactly the wrong things. You know, it's interesting the way you put that, all the different facets to say we were very countercultural and we are continuing to be countercultural. It feels great the way you articulated that. I had not thought about it in all those facets, to be honest. But, but isn't that what you did? You, did, you were counter on all the major points vis-a-vis -vis your competitors. Yeah, and you know, even with my board, which has been a very good board. So investors include Mike Maples, Floodgate, Polaris, Dave Barrett, Matt Murphy represents Kleiner Perkins, even though he's at Menlo. Uh, and then we had uh, money coming in from uh, Google. Kareem Farris is on the board. And then lately, uh, Holger which of Stout. course is interesting because you could argue Google's a competitor, oh, right? Yeah. Or at, at least the there's end. some overlap, right? There is at the low end of the market, yes. Um, I would be uh, a liar to tell you that oh, they were very copacetic with what we were doing. In the first five or six years, there was tremendous pressure on two things. One is, hey, uh, why aren't you doing a freemium? 
I did not do a freemium. I, so I have a freemium. It's the 15 day free trial. And uh, we don't do anything beyond that. Sometimes it might get extended. Yeah, so that's right. Not- I forgot that you were not doing freemium at a time when everybody was, we Correct. give it away and then we have an extra, you know, super special program that we charge for. But for the most part, you can use it for free forever. Yeah. And that was another reason why we didn't have to use uh, or raise boatloads of money because a lot of the freemium providers, especially in our industry, you have hard, tangible costs. Storage. Storage is not cheap. I mean, you have to provide storage. And what companies end up doing is they will put that cost of storage for free accounts, not in your uh, below the line or in the cogs. They'll put that below in OPEX as marketing expense. And the gross margin looks good. The operating margin takes a hit. But of course, you need a ton of money for that. I believed that this market will mature to the point that I will not need to entice the IT buyer. This whole problem of shadow IT will will disappear. People will accept this category. You just had to remain patient while we were assiduously building our business. But the pressure from our own board was intense to say, beneath. Everyone's talking about the cloud. You seem to be swimming upstream. And I remember, I think you and I chatted uh, earlier, where I said, I don't want to go with the flow. It's for the dead fish. I'm not going to do that. And um, it, it Hold on, Vinny. Can, can you say that again? I just love it. You don't want to go with the flow. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know what the old saying, right? Don't go with the flow. It's only for the dead fish. Um, <laughs> I love it. So it, it, it took, but, but at the same time, I was able to sort of defray the pressure because we were still growing and the margins were improving. So on one hand, I was getting flack from my own board to an extent. There was the industry pressure. I know we were talking to the press and the analysts and they regarded us to be a little bit like heretics to say, you'll be short-lived. It'll be transient. Everything's going to go to the cloud. And I still said no. Uh, the, the best rejoinder was look at the mythical paperless office, uh, business week, by the way, claims in Wikipedia, they invented that term in 1975 and the world has less paper. It's more specialized, but it's never paperless. And I believe unstructured data or files as we, uh, work with, they'll remain a combination of on-prem and cloud, but it did take a lot of, uh, gumption and sort of thick skin to say, no, don't believe in that. And, and for years, right? Started. For years and years. I mean, you had to... Um, six to uh, seven years initially. Yeah, six years, I would say for sure. Yeah, it was, I was, in my mind, I almost said, stick to your guns and have big balls were the two things in my mind. And I was like, stick to your big balls. <laughs> 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 but really, that's what you had to do for five to seven years, which maybe in some industries might not sound like super long. But in our industry... That's three lifetimes, arguably, right? Yeah, man. You know, when you look back at it, to say, boy, it's been that long. I mean, you kind of are the the tortoise, aren't you? In a way, yes. Slow and steady. You're right. Yeah. 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 And do you have any amount of, because if I were in your shoes having achieved what you've achieved, I would have a lot of neener nonner, fuck you, told you so in me. But I'm, you're probably a better person than me. But how do you feel about um, that your counter strategy on virtually all the things your competitors were doing, you did the opposite or something meaningfully, and I'm going to use this word on purpose, different. And that different has meaningfully paid off in building a sustainable long time cash flow now business that just raised 75 million bucks from, you know, arguably the number one eye banking firm in the world, Goldman Sachs. Honestly, Chris, uh, I don't know about others, but there's so much to be done even at this point that uh, I don't really spend too much time thinking or looking back to say, wow, we've done all this or look how smart we've been. And I, I'm being very transparent with you. It's just uh, like I'm looking at, in fact, just to show you what I was thinking. So last year, uh, before I went for a fundraise, um, we had our June board meeting and I walked in into the board meeting and I uh, said to all the board members, I said, how many of you remember high school physics? And they were like, what the hell is he going to talk about? And I said, if you remember a concept called half-life of an atom, and the first hand that went up was Mike Maples. And of course there was peer pressure. So a lot of other hands went up. And I said, so the first half of Ignite was 10. 
The next half is going to be four. And I am absolutely certain we'll 4x to 5x the value of the company as it exists today. And I absolutely believe in that. And that's sort of the overarching goal that, you know, you're looking forward, not looking back. So to say, do you feel satisfaction that, yeah, I've proven everyone right? You don't have much time to reflect on that. At the same time, we were at our sales kickoff um, uh, two weeks back uh, in Spokane. We flew in 200 people there. It's so much cheaper than the Bay Area. First rate facilities. And I was in a big uh, conference room at the Davenport Grand Hotel, which is a pretty big hotel. And we had 200 people in this hall and I'm looking at it. And at that moment, honestly, it dawned on me, holy shit, we built this. At that moment, there was like a good feeling of sort of, wow, we are here. But that was it. Then you move on. You're worrying about Q1 right now. <laughs> then, hey, how about the quarter? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, I just, um, I really admire what you've done, Vanit, because a, a lot of entrepreneurs would have been lulled into a head-on competition and would have lost that battle because category king economics apply. And they would have tried to compete with a better product and they would have believed in their better product to go head to head against, um, you know, in some cases your competitors are some of the biggest companies on, in, on the planet, never mind biggest tech companies. And yet you figured out what you wanted to do, who you wanted to serve, what you believed. You built a product around a point of view and you've carved out um, a place for yourself that, uh, you know, now in the, the niche that you've chosen, you've become the emerging NetSuite, the emerging category king in, in the uh, small to mid size, but still requiring enterprise capabilities around content and, and storage and collaboration. And that's a hell of a fucking achievement. Yeah, in a way it is. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's no rest for the weary. It's, um, I'm looking at to say, okay, how big can we make this to be? Um, and, you know, uh, you, you've known. I, so I've been in the Bay Area or in the U.S. for now 26 years. So it's home for me. But I kind of still wear that immigrant chip on my shoulders, which kind of motivates me. And there's always that hunger to prove yourself. The hunger to be, like if you said, Vineet, what do you want out of Ignite? Man, money is secondary. It's a derivative, right? It's more about if people would say, man, this guy built a very successful product company. The word product keeps popping in my head. And the joy of building a great product where somebody bumps into you and says, hey, I use Ignite and we love using the product. I don't care what they're paying us. It's that joy. Yeah. That, that to me is exhilarating. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Well, Vineet, um, I know you got to run. Is there anything else you want to touch on before we kick out? No, man, it's been, it's been so much fun, uh, you know, being where we are. And I remember our long running association in the initial first couple of years, what we put together. I think it was foundational. Well, and look what it's led to. Well, I've I've so loved getting to know you. I've loved working with you and your team. Um, certainly, it's always fun to be part of the beginning. It's really fun to see this play out to where it is now. And if you're open to it, you'll tell me what the right timing is. But would love to have you come back a little further along to begin to kind of unpack this story as it continues to uh, to play out. Because I think you are. Um, you know, the, the entrepreneurial success that gets celebrated a lot in our world are the, the you know, the, the company that starts with a PowerPoint and 15 seconds later, it's a unicorn and, you know, then it's Snapchat <laughs> or whatever. And, and look, God bless Snapchat or whoever else that, that has that sort of absolute, you know, or if you look at the bird, the, sp the scooter company or this kind of stuff, you know, those are moonshot things and that's fun and that's cool. And I, I, I take nothing away from those entrepreneurs, but there's a big part of me and maybe it's, you know, my immigrant thing. Maybe it's because I, you know, delivered newspapers as a kid. And I really relate to kind of who you are and what you've done. This like, I'm going to figure this fucking thing out. I'm going to bang at this thing. I'm going to do it for a decade. And here you are. And so there's, there, it, it makes me happy to know that in modern day Silicon Valley, um, you know, you can have the level of success that you've had. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank you for taking me along for some of the ride. And I'd love thank to have you, you back in the future to kind of keep, keep the update going and sharing your learnings along the way. I promise you uh, a month or two before we go ring the bell, I'll be here. 
That would be fantastic. Thank you, sir. All right, Vineet, have a legendary day, my friend. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, Vineet Jain. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Now, it's got to be growth time for your business, and the good folks at NetSuite want to help you master your growth. Check out netsuite.com slash different, and uh, there you will be able to set up a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry, and you will learn why thousands of super high-growth startups and nonprofits rely on NetSuite as the business management software to handle every aspect of their business. And NetSuite grows with you from the garage to the IPO and beyond. With NetSuite, you can run your business from a smartphone. You can have awesome dashboards that help you stay on top of sales, finance, accounting, orders, inventory, and even HR. Thousands of the best-known brands and fastest-growing companies use NetSuite to manage their business, and now it's available to you. And it's a lot more cost-effective than you might anticipate. So why not check out netsuite.com slash different today and sign up for your free one-hour growth review. All right. We would like to thank the good folks at Ignite, and that's spelled E-G-N-Y-T-E, content collaboration, data protection, and infrastructure modernization at ignite.com. HarperCollins, uh, instant classic, play bigger. How pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets. Available pretty much where uh, every, everywhere, anywhere, anywhere where legendary books are available. <laughs> OneLifeFullyLived.org. This is the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. Check out the number one life fully lived all one word, dot O-R-G, today. The best-selling book from my dear friend and uh, longtime repeat guest on this podcast, the amazing Dushka Zapata and her book, How to Be Ferociously Happy and Other Essays. A podcast that I love from a guy who's been called the nicest man in podcasting. He's also the producer of this podcast. Why not check out Culture Eats Strategy wherever you pick up legendary podcasts. Flourishing Leadership Institute. This is the organization that leads positive change for some of the most um, important companies on the planet. Why not check out lead, the number two, flourish.com today. Now, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to grow and you want to be innovative and you want to be cool and you want to be on top of it, why not check out growwire.com. It's what legendary entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial people are reading. There's a podcast, there's a YouTube channel, and there's lots of awesome content. Check out growwire.com. Now, are you in Australia? Do you want to do some legendary marketing down under? Why not check out Rapid Media, legendary marketing, media, and communications at rapidmedia.com.au. And are you a young person looking for an alternative to college that'll help you uh, launch your career in the right direction? Then why not check out Praxis, an alternative to college that focuses on practical education and apprenticeship. Go to discoverpraxis, P-R-A-X-I-S dot com today. And the amazing folks at Kiva.org. These folks help entrepreneurs in the developing world with uh, no cost, zero interest loans. If you want to make a difference to entrepreneurs who need it the most, check out kiv.org. All right, I need to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes, and this podcast is the sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network. And we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. Why not? Share the shit out of this podcast. If you get anything at all out of this podcast, then why not send it to a friend or post it on social media? We also need to warn you that all rights do remain disturbed um, and that this podcast goes way better, clearly, with some libations. Support your local entrepreneurs. Don't forget to buy John's Crazy Socks at johnscrazysocks.com. Tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. And don't forget, if you're an iPhone user, and you have Siri enabled, you can just grab your mom or your dad or your brother or your friend's phone and you can say, hey Siri, subscribe to Christopher Lockhead, follow your different, and she'll do it for you or any other podcast you want to subscribe to. So why not give that a try? If nothing else, it's a fun party trick. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Listen to Robert Earl Keen. There's no stopping the Cretans from hopping. Only buy pasture-raised free-range eggs. Thanks, Dandy Candy. 
I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Richard C. Kelly, chairman of PG&E. Sorry, Dick. We just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you, my legendary friends. And until next time, follow your different.